Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Ishan Russell and in wake of the attacks in France and also a lot that has been happening in India in terms of questioning of freedom of expression. So today we decided to focus on freedom of expression versus expression of hate. Now the Indian constitution through Article 19A guarantees us the right to freedom of speech and expression but also imposes some restrictions through Clause 2 of the Article 19 that include restrictions like impinging upon decency and morality. But these are very ambiguous terms. So tonight we ask, is there a limit to the term, to the term freedom of expression? Does challenging set notions about religions, persons, polity, etc. be termed as expressions of hate? Is violent expression of hate equally as dangerous as social, verbal or ideological expression of hate? Now these are some of the questions that we will be exploring with Mr. M. M. Ansari. He's the chief, uh, so from a Central Information Commissioner. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Rakesh Batabyal, historian at uh, JNU and uh, Sanjay Singh, political editor of First Post. We'll also be joined by Siddharth Vardarajan, uh, eminent journalist and senior fellow at Shivnadar University in just a bit. But uh, Sanjay Singh, I'll start with you. As far as freedom of expression in this context is concerned, in terms of what we're discussing, I mean, the Indian constitution also says there are limits, but uh, can real limits be ever exposed on, uh, imposed on freedom of expression? See, Isan, I think no freedom comes uh, in term, in absolute terms because if you go on thinking that if you have freedom of something, uh, this is absolutely absolute, then that is not possible. Because in Indian context, if you see so many people uh, right-wing uh, fringe elements uh, within Sangh Parivar, outside of Sangh Parivar, leftist elements, extremist, they say so many things and some restriction has to be imposed. As for media, you, when you get freedom of expression, you also have certain responsibility to carry on that freedom of expression. And that uh, those riders, of course, uh, they are left way vague, but when it comes to into practical domain, people actually who carry out uh, this thing, uh, hmm. they actually know as to how far can we go. Hmm. We, for instance, don't publish gory pictures. Right. What happened in Paris, that has been some cause-effect uh, analysis is being made as for freedom of expression versus freedom of hate or uh, hate practices that you said. That was a terror act. Hmm. That cannot be justified saying that, okay, this thing was published and therefore a terror act has taken place and uh, thus just feasible. I don't think that's uh, a good thing to do. All right, fair enough. Uh, but, but Mr. Ansari, at the end of the day, I mean, I, through, all through social media, I've been, I've been exploring before the show, and uh, it certainly seems that uh, a lot of people are sort of saying that, why provocate in the first place? But that's the point of journalism, that's the point of satire, that it will provocate. It, comedy also, is, it, it generates a, a lot of inquiries and a lot of uh, people who might not like it, but does it, at the end of the day, impinge upon somebody else's freedom? Well, it does. And uh, we have seen that the lakhs of people are exercising their freedom of expression and uh, uh, that is not causing any problem. Mm. But when it happens that the people uh, with uh, strong affiliation with, uh, certain, with certain political uh, parties or with strong affiliation with certain cultural identities, mm. when they make uh, these kind, kinds of observations, they may be in minority and they may also get support from some of the uh, liberals, you know, the way they interpret about the freedom of expression. It is that which is causing the problem and they exceed, you know, what we call the limits or they cross the Lakshman Rekha. So what happens is, I mean, there are those who are in absolute majority in expressing a particular view, exercising their own freedom of expression uh, because it suits their cultural identities but without realizing that it is going to impact heavily, hmm. you know, on uh, the large number of people uh, who would feel it otherwise and that affects what we call the peace, the law and order situation. So my concern is with both, you know, those who have uh, uh, certain cultural backgrounds and they make certain observations. Uh, I don't want to name anyone because uh, you will see them from different political parties, from different cultural backgrounds. They have been talking of all these uh, and there are also those who liberally uh, interpret whatever they are saying, but a majority of them are affected and therefore uh, when we uh, examine uh, you know, the relevance of freedom of expression and speech right. and also freedom of uh, faith, we need to see uh, that how it is viewed by a majority of the people who feel hurt 
you know, and that right, is so where the, the, the moment you see that. So it's the voice of the majority. majority that should determine. That, that should be yes, the determining you factor. Have the but data. then, 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 Siddharth Vada Rajan, I'll come to you. Then, how do we move on from here? Then we only have established notions, and anybody who challenges those established notions is seem, uh, is seemingly anarchic in a way, then. I'm sorry, I uh, joined the discussion late, so I can only uh, guess the context of... Uh, oh, all right, I'll fill so in in the context we're talking see, about. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in any society, yeah. Yeah, I, I, we're just talking about freedom of expression versus freedom of uh, hate. The fact that uh, does freedom of expression often provoke uh, and uh, does it unnecessarily provoke? So that is the context that we're discussing this in and that is the context the question was in. Okay. Look, you see, uh, th there's two aspects here, right? One is uh, freedom of expression, which I am not in favor of compromising on the basis of what has happened in Paris or on the basis of uh, individuals, even if they represent uh, a, a large or small group, claiming that they feel offended. Uh, so in my view, uh, these kinds of attacks, if anything, strengthens one's, one's own resolve to defend uh, the freedom of expression. At the same time, uh, you know, uh, th th there's a question of good taste. And I think those who uh, are in the field of uh, writing or journalism or whatever are constantly making uh, calculations or estimations uh, about uh, what is proper, what is improper. And this is really a, a subjective determination of, of an individual cartoonist, of an individual writer, of an editor, uh, of, 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 a, of a publication as a whole. Uh, so, uh, uh, so my definition of what is good taste uh, may be quite different from the definition of somebody else. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the freedom of expression, I will defend uh, that person's uh, freedom to exercise or indulge his bad taste. So I think that uh, you know, uh, there will be individuals who, fe who will feel offended. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sadly, in our country at least, the bounds of causing offense seem to be getting uh, wider and wider. Uh, there's no telling what, when, and how is going to cause some individual somewhere hmm. uh, a professed uh, 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 offence or not. Hmm. So I think that uh, the time has come to shift the debate away from uh, individuals claiming to have been offended to, uh, to saying, look, if somebody is offended, what are the lawful uh, methods that are available to him or her uh, to take recourse against such kind of offence? And uh, so I think that's where the debate needs to go, that if, if, if I find something in a movie or a play or a cartoon or an article that is objectionable to, my, to, to me personally or to, to me, depending on whichever collective right, so or group I belong mm -hmm. to, uh, there should be a, uh, a lawful way of expressing that opposition rather than... All right, so uh, you're so saying I, I legal recourse rather than street protests or threats that... Somebody indulging in an act of freedom... Exp uh, well, well, one second, one second. <clears throat> you, see, you see, I reject the idea that somebody who displays poor taste in his exercise of the freedom of expression mm -hmm. is causing a law and order problem. The law and order problem is caused by individuals who do not know how to respond in a democratic and peaceful manner to things that they do not like in society. Mm. Uh, all of us live in a, in a society where there are rules and uh, you know, th these rules prescribe ways of, of, of protesting. Mm. And I think uh, anybody who violates those ways of protesting, they are the ones who are posing a threat to law and order rather than uh, somebody who purportedly causes them offence or actually causes them offence. All right, uh, so Dr. Bhattabhyal, uh, as far as what Siddharth was saying, just taking off from there, but he's a little bit opposed to what Dr. Ansari was, uh, Bisansari was saying uh, in terms of uh, how do you view it? Uh, there's a fine balance, there's the grey area of uh, that subjectiveness of the entire argument, of uh, the entire right of freedom of expression or speech. You know, the second part of what Siddharth Varadarajan was saying is absolutely correct. You know, there mm. are individual tastes and they, ma they vary from person to person, society to society, and they, cause, they may cause worries. The f issue is not about those worries, but mm. issue is how the, those worries or hates or whatever you call it are expressed in a democratic order. I will take, I think, the debate further. I think this is an issue of um, civilization and democracy also. You know, sometimes they are consonant with each other. Mm. And how a civilization grows along with democracy, and this is the last 200, 300 years of history of democracy, where civilization absorbs the ways and de develops ways to handle issues where person, communities, groups, nations are hurt, right. and how they handle it. And there I think Gandhi was very relevant. You know, handle it. Methods of handling 
your distaste mm. the second is how civilization and democracy sometimes be dissonance and there i think our society faces a tra- very serious question where it is unequal society mm. the democracy has helped unequals in unequals to voice their expressions of hate against unequal system mm. now if we take an absolute term the hate and love then this kind of dissonances this kind of voices cannot ever be heard because some section for whom the liberals for instance for whom pornography or is anything of that kind should not be suppressed because this is a freedom of expression but poverty is equally obscene mm. so how does or how do poor express their distrust of the system mm. so these are systemic issues in an unequal society mm. so th- therefore what siddharth bharadrajan is saying is correct because the method has to be even a poor or a rich they must have their ways of expression the law and order situation or whatever systemic um, uh, system that we have should be equally treating both of them right but th- then that is what we should be achieving for but have we achieved that i'm suggesting uh, given what we've been seeing even in india on the streets uh, i mean it seems we have far removed from that right now actually in real uh, i think gradually is becoming intolerant society and intolerant polity uh, because if you see there are too many protests happening uh, in terms of if you see in terms of a movie that was uh, that uh, recently became a blockbuster then you have so many people saying uh, so many things and there have been protest and so many retaliatory statements yes uh, there is certain uh, uh, of course uh, what siddharth was saying and what uh, professor batavadal was saying uh, you but i am of the opinion that freedom of expression cannot be absolute hmm. um, uh, there are certain sensibilities have to be drawn hmm. who draws that right that has to there has to be a self uh, censorship nobody else can come in and uh, there cannot be a governmental mechanism or any other institutional mechanism that those lines are not defined hmm. but that has to be there within that Uh, from emanate uh, should emanate from that particular person from that organization from uh, that collective leadership that uh, the place might have and also society at large because if this thing goes on and there uh, there are street protest which turns violent then there are groups which open fire where does it go hmm. that line has to be drawn all right mr ansari but i'm taking off from what sanjay singh said uh, where does it go but uh, at the end of the day you have Okay, cartoons that are published that were in distaste, but then you have people inciting people to violence against the publishers of those cartoons. So, in in a sense, I mean, does everybody have their freedom of expression guaranteed in the entire chain, or somebody who's inciting somebody to violence? They're not often taken to task as well. I mean, you had an MP, uh, MLA over in India offering fifty one crores for uh, the task. Well, in exercising these rights, uh, I view that. Uh, there are three stakeholders uh, particularly in democratic societies have the equal responsibility the one who makes a provoca- uh, pro- uh, uh, provocative statement mm. you know and uh, uh, and uh, on the basis of which there is a majority which uh, takes another view opposing mm. what has been said so uh, they are also exercising uh, their own democratic rights and they alone cannot be held responsible that why they are expressing uh, their views in a different way against the one who has uh, provoked them and then at the same time there are also the liberal elements the social media and all those who are now interpreting and saying uh, and they are also taking sides in favor of those who are uh, opposing or agitating against the statement or even those who have said whatever they have said so uh, we we take a different view so all these three uh, elements in the whole process the one who uh in the first instance uses his rights mm. to provoke certain uh, group certain uh, communities and the others who oppose it again they are using their own uh, uh, right of expression and they are agitating in a democratic way and then they are the third force mm. which is interpreting you know and trying to keep the whole debate live so i think all of them must equally share the responsibility mm. and the uh cash point should be that wherever the law and order and the peace is disturbed all those people who are responsible for it whether somebody is in the first instance making a statement mm. or those who are opposing it or even those who are 
uh, uh, interpreting it differently, trying to create a conflicting situation in the whole society. All, right. All of them should be held responsible in the whole process. All right, so you think responsibility lies with everybody, but uh, Siddharth Vatarajan, in terms of uh, fixing responsibility, I mean, uh, it seems uh, society at large, is, uh, or, or uh, certain groups for certain, uh, are uh, fixing responsibility on media, and the media being the messengers often are, are bearing the brunt of it, be it Paris or be it uh, elsewhere. Look, I simply can't accept uh, the equivalence that is being established or sought to be established mm. between uh, a cartoonist who uh, exercises bad taste, say, mm. uh, and offends somebody, and a person who uh, picks up a gun and shoots that person. I, I, I refuse to accept this. Mm. Uh, were, were there, you know, you know, the second category of people that uh, uh, Dr. Ansari mentioned, of course, there should be, if there are people who are offended, there should be peaceful protests, mass protests. Uh, people can respond by writing, by drawing cartoons, by a, a wide variety of ways. They can, they can petition the courts, they can petition the government uh, for action. But, you know, to, once we concede the principle that uh, a work of art which causes offense to somebody hmm. is as responsible for any violence that happens as the fellow who throws a stone or picks up a gun, then there's no end to this, I'm afraid. Then that means we, can, we, we, we will have to condemn the filmmakers of PK hmm. because some misguided uh, fanatics claim that this offends their religion. We will have to condemn the, uh, the, the composer of a song, say, who feels that this song is offensive to uh, his or her sensibilities. Where does this all end? The fact of the matter is that in our society, in, in, whether we're speaking of India or France, hmm. uh, the law and the cultural uh, milieu of the society provides ample scope for individuals and collectives to vent, ventilate their grievances, to show their opposition, to show their hurt, to show their, the fact that their feelings have been, have been, uh, have been, have been upset uh, by, by anything that somebody does. All right, but and, that, and that do, we get, the, uh, do we get too uh, afraid when the matter have. of faith comes uh, up? You know, and so, 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 Sorry, do we get too afraid when? When the matter of faith, when we talk, when suddenly the faith... The matter of faith. Yes. You see, it's, it's unfortunate that, that when it comes to faith and religion, everybody gets, uh, you know, you, 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 you circle the wagons and you, you know, people start getting, oh, this is wrong. I mean, across, whether we're speaking of the Islamic tradition or the Hindu tradition or the, or the uh, you know, uh, Christian traditions and so on, there's plenty of evidence going back into history where people have raised questions, including pointed questions. There's been debate. There have been, you know, very, very vigorous debate on you know, fundamental issues, right? So, so why all of a sudden now in the 21st century are we getting all prickly uh, and worried about causing somebody offense about something? I think people need to react in a modern, cultural, civilized way. Mm. And if you, as I said, you don't like something somebody says or something somebody writes, respond to that appropriately. Uh, there's no prohibition or bar on, on uh, somebody, you know, responding in that manner. But it's right. when, uh, you know, so this law and order issue whether it's an act of terrorism or it's, a, it's a tearing down film posters and threatening film goers, this, this has to be judged as a crime in and of itself without any, uh, uh, you know, uh, prevarication here. I, you know, and I won't accept that there is uh, equivalence between those who break the law and those who uh, do something uh, which may be uh, not necessarily to the liking of those who break the law. All right, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ansari, I'll let you respond to that. But uh, Dr. Badakte, uh, as far as uh, what Siddharth was saying, uh, the matter of faith, uh, once that comes in, everybody just wants their hands off it, perhaps, not saying that it's better left alone. But at the end of the day, I mean, the, the religions of the world are also centuries old. They've evolved over centuries. So, I mean, they've also seen the changes and weathered those changes. This is simple politics. Uh, so far as confessions of faith is concerned, you have icons, mm. like Jesus takes the entire guilt of humanity on himself. Mm. Buddha throws himself in front of a raging tiger or lion. So, just antithetical to what is happening, that you express your hate using the expression of your freedom of expression. Now, on the other hand, the history shows that the civilizational norms of what Siddharth was referring to as civility mm. has been expanding. Mm. And so is democratic rights of expression. So both have to be, ex have, have to be expanding. Otherwise, humans have no civilization. Mm. And in that context, therefore, what happens in Paris has resonance in our society too. What is happening here is not just expression of, uh, expression of hate, 
but what goes behind that expression is mm. the idea what kind of ideas that are floating europe for instance has a huge community or huge groups of fu extreme fundamentalist who poison in many many places in central europe western europe there are very major group which are extremely fundamentalist of all kinds in a society where large number of priests are looking for jobs now mm. in a society which has been or not even secular is a post secular mm. this religion of churches have become tourist spots mm. where you pay money and see the church there is no priest right. in that society groups are coming which are expressing their hate in the name of religion where this religion is declining mm. so this is a matter of politics not religion mm. similarly in our context itself taking cue from that what is ex being expressed is not religion mm. because if you go in the late 19th century any part of of the country the religious disputation between hindus and muslims and sikhs and all sects were tremendous you know mm. i i can't give you an example if you go in the 1890s the tracts in punjab for instance with the sikhism as a religion religious category was emerging you have went you know abusive fights but there was no riot mm. so therefore something is amiss hmm. and what is that amiss is the kind of hate that we are uh, kind of society that we are creating where zones as somebody was referring to zones of engagement hmm. are becoming drawn in a different manner hmm. which may not be civilizational may be anti civilizational hmm. and therefore that is a threat to democracy because in our country civilization and democracy are going simultaneously right all right mr ansari responding to that well uh, yes uh, uh, i must say that uh, siddharth has misunderstood me i am not trying to establish any equivalence uh, between uh, the those who are taking guns and those who are provoking certain communities to react in certain ways what i am trying to say is that anyone who makes certain statement mm. uh, and anyone who takes uh, and adopts certain means to oppose it mm. you know they are definitely responsible for disturbing the peace mm. you know and anyone who has disturbed the peace is responsible for violation of the rights of expression this is what i'm trying to say mm. and here the role of uh, you know the media the liberals is very very important because it is uh, the liberals who come out with different interpretation and that create uh, you know the conflicting situation in which these kind of so, people and the groups they get uh, certain support because they find that they are not all wrong mm. whether somebody has made certain statement or someone has made uh, or adopted certain means of opposing it in whatever ways that they have done so my fundamental principle is that anyone who is disturbing peace mm. is responsible for the whole thing so someone may have initiated you know mm. and if someone has initiated initiated without realizing uh, the repercussions of what they no, are doing even then and this is happening but that's the point that yeah. the fact that you say, keep say initiate and the, the uh, it's a provocative statement in shows that i mean at the end of the day then we're placing affixing some responsibility on the the, the statement or the act itself and that's a very that's subjective uh, matter isn't it no no it is it is subjective but at the same time there are ways to a certain uh, 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 whether someone has really disturbed the peace, because in the last few months mm. we have seen uh, our own leaders from different political parties and the different communities have been making different kinds of statement, mm. and the entire society is very much disturbed about what is all happening in the whole society. And I hold all of them responsible because they are creating a very conflicting situation in the whole society, and they are in a way affecting the law and other situation. And therefore, I consider that all of them are misusing it. Right. Here, therefore, I am trying. to emphasize that it is the role of the media and the liberals to take a conscious view of the entire matter and say that anyone who uh, that at times it oh, is not right. only the law we should see that what is the impact on the society so i'm looking right. at the, the impact overall on the impact on the society all right so that you, you have a point very quickly because we all just out of time yeah you say <clears throat> yes i just want to we need, uh, you know i take i uh, take what ansari ji has said and I, you know we should distinguish it in two things one is you know hate speech where mm. somebody where a politician typically is inciting hatred against this or that religion this or that community right obviously that's that's not acceptable uh, in terms of free speech the other is where somebody is uh, poking fun at uh, at different religions exercising humor you know we uh, to 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 club the latter kind of freedom of expression mm. with the conscious inculcation of hate mm. by politicians i think is unfair I, i don't think we should equate the two all right 
All right, Sanjay Singh, I'll give you the final word because mm -hmm. we have been hearing a lot of expressions of hate also amongst our politicians. So perhaps, as Siddharth was suggesting, law and order, it's high time, took its own course and did something about it. And we really, as a society, started to crack down upon it because you don't know who's getting affected how and tomorrow you could have gunmen running rampant across the country. See, the subject now you are talking about, uh, that lately, or if not lately, lately that phenomena has become widespread. But then the fact remains that most of these things are done for two things, A, for political gains, and B, also for social gains because they expand their uh, horizon and, their, and, polarize society. and their influence and so on and so forth. Because th that some groups, they do it just to grab the headlines and therefore become uh, important in whatever domain they are. And also politically should that influence some section of voters and uh, uh, and some section of people to uh, uh, help some particular p political party. But then no religion, no faith, no God is so weak that he or he, he gets affected by somebody expressing something. And the most recent example was PK. Of mm. course, that was a beautiful movie. Mm. And after a few days of protest, violent protest, and when the uh, government did not react or did not uh, or was firm on its stand that nothing doing they are not going the to the government intervene. also didn't crack down on yeah them. yeah and then all those things subsided okay that gives a sense that these things of course are guided motivated with a certain purpose all right they're motivated with a certain purpose and at that purpose often leads to divisiveness of society and which is the bigger worry in terms of uh, what has been happening in paris or whether it's been happening over here on that note we'll have to wrap it up uh, but thank you very much siddharth vadar rajan uh, dr rakesh batabdeal uh, mr mm ansari and sanjay singh for coming in and sharing your various perspectives on this so hope uh, you understood a little more about the freedom of expression do exercise it do talk about it do tell us uh, what you think about it you can obviously go to our website and let us know what you think about uh, program but uh, freedom of expression is such a thing that uh, often it has a caveat our constitution certainly says so but uh, then at the end of the day it's up to us uh, to figure out what that really means thanks so much for watching goodbye